Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Your Overseas Home. My name is Christopher Nye, Senior Editor at Your Overseas Home. Today, we will be meeting the three experts you need to help you buy uh, a property in France safely and easily and pleasurably, one would hope. Uh, they're so vital, we call them the Golden Three. And it's great to have you with us today, whether you're uh, here with us live or catching up on, uh, on demand. We are thrilled to help you realize your dream to own a property in France. Now, today's session will be an hour, uh, uh, one hour long. And for those of you listening in live, there'll be plenty of opportunities to put your questions to the speaker. Speakers, if you wish to ask anything, just type your query into the questions tab on the side, uh, on the right hand side of your screen. And of course, if you need a reminder of anything discussed today, or you want to share this with family or friends, a replay is available on the Your Overseas Home website to watch at your leisure. I am delighted to be joined today by our trusted Golden Three experts. Now, we're going to do it in, in the order that we kind of think that you should um, do the property process. So the first thing is the guest who is from uh, Smart Currency Exchange, who's going to be giving you a bit of background on how to do the, the, the money side of it safely. And... Um, Quite exciting times in the currency markets uh, at the moment, so we may touch on where the pound is going at the moment. Uh, Paul's been working within foreign exchange for eight years, and um, and he's based in London. Uh, after that, we will be talking to Anthony Bryan from uh, Beauvillage Immobilier, and he will tell us more about uh, what he does and how long how long he's been there. And lastly, we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Leah Maynard from Buckles Law who is, as the name suggests, going to tell you about the legal process. So uh, enough of me. Uh, let me start off by uh, welcoming Paul. And if you would like to just give us an introduction to SMART and how they can uh, support our, our viewers today. Great. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for attending. Um, so as Chris said, I'm here representing SMART Currency, uh, and we can play a, a pivotal role uh, in the buying journey for you um, and we can help you for right from the early stages so um, often currency will be the one of the last things you may actually think about getting around to doing because you'll have to find the property first and, and agree contracts and things but we can be uh, a real asset to you from the early stages to you help with your budgeting um, so you'll have the you'll have the amount of money that's available to you in your bank account have the amount of money that you're looking to spend we can just help you understand how far that can go as into into afford, of the affordability of certain properties in France. Uh, so that's where we can really help from the early stages. And wh where we where we specialise is is the risk management side of things. So as Chris mentioned, the currency markets recently have been uh, not too favourable for the sterling. Uh, we've had a little bit of a bit, little bit of a fight back, but there's been some rocky uh, rocky roads over the last over the last few weeks. Uh, and that's again where we can help you out. We can help you try and avoid the downsides. Uh, and really target the the uptides in the market. And so again, as we're talking to you early, um, that, that's that's where we can really start to to target things and make things a bit more cost cost effective for you. Um, so yeah, with a market like we've got at the moment, we'd advise to speak to you from, right from the just the moment where you're thinking about buying. Okay, I I, I just noticed that that the pound to euro has just shot up by about one and a half percent today. Now. I understand there's something called a forward contract, so I can lock that in. Can you can you tell me about that? Yeah, a forward contract is is great for a property buyer. Um, a forward contract essentially will lock in today's rate, uh, and you can pay it a future date. So, for example, if you're if you're in France or, or you've agreed on a property, uh, you you may not have to actually physically pay for the property for let's say three months. Uh, but as as you said today, we've had a, a, a small uptick on the market, which would make it a little bit cheaper. So we can actually fix today's exchange rate, and you don't actually have to pay for it until the contract is is due. The only thing we would take at the at the start would be a ten, up to up to a ten percent deposit, uh, but that's not a fee. It just comes out of the total balance, and that deposit just basically holds the exchange rate for you. And then at the time of completion, you just pay the remaining balance, and and you've guaranteed that rate. So it take gives you complete peace of mind. That when you agree a price in euros, uh, your price is also fixed in pound sterling as well, or, or whichever currency you're holding at the time. So it's uh, it, it's a real peace of mind tool that we've got for you, and, and it just guarantees the price. Peace of mind until the property deal falls through. Then what happens in 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 that circumstance? 
these things do happen. Um, I mean, we can be flexible with those contracts. We, 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 look, we never want to cap, go into a contract with with one of our clients and with the intention of cancelling it. Uh, so if you've got uh, if you've got a forward contract booked in uh, and there is an, either, an ex, either an extension to the contract, perhaps the tenants in the house uh, are in a chain, maybe, and you know they, I, that, that could be a, could be a thing. You might need to extend it. We can certainly do that uh, if the if the the, the property's purchase falls through entirely. Again, we can roll the contract on and look to hold it for you. If you are looking to completely cancel it, we can do that as well. Um, and we can work that out with a trader at the time. We'll always do what's, whatever's best for you and, and what you're looking to do. So just because you've booked it doesn't mean you're absolutely fixed to, 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 to follow through. These, these things do happen. We can work with you. Great. OK. Now, um, why would I go with you rather than, say, one of the online only options wise? Let's say, or or with my the bank I've been banking with for the last thirty years. Um, well, the first thing we've just mentioned forward contracts uh, online with with Wise and the other online providers and the banks they don't offer forward contracts, and um, so it's more of a spot contract, which is you agree a price today and you pay today. But where we really differ, certainly against the online providers, is the level of service you're going to offer. Uh, well, well, what we can offer, sorry. So if you're using a, a company like Wise or, or Revolut or, or one of the other online providers, you're you're on your own. Um, so if you've got a bit of knowledge of the markets, that's that's great. Um, but you may not know what what potential market releases are coming that could affect the market. Um, and you are again, like I said, you're, you're very much on your own. So you're just timing it right. And sometimes sometimes people will get it bang on and, and they'll see a, a high point and book a book of spot spot contracts and get it right. But there are more cases where you, you know, people don't understand exactly what they're doing with the markets and they'll get it wrong. Um, they might be fixed into contracts that, that that don't work for them and they don't have that person to speak to. And that's certainly the benefit against uh, an online provider. With a bank, um, the prices the banks offer initially, they're, they're not great anyway. So we're always going to be a better exchange rate than a bank. But again, you could walk into a branch um, and you know, the person you speak to um, across the desk may not have any knowledge of, of, of uh, foreign exchange either. You may take their word for it that they're giving you a good exchange rate, but they may have no no knowledge and they're just typing a number in on a screen and giving you a price. Um, there's no real service there. They're not going to be able to give the guidance that we can offer. Um, so they're the main two things. I mean, it's, it's the service and sort of the hand-holding aspect that we can we can, we can can offer. Also, pricing is, is more competitive. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? People people will will go for an online option with with they just a tiny bit better on the rate, and yet the rate's going to move up and down and all over the place before uh, before you buy anyway. It could be ten percent different, so it seems odd that one would worry about that. Much much better to go for that, uh, avoiding the big risk, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, speaking of which, I, I suppose one has to ask the question: How do I know my money is safe with Smart? Yeah, I mean, it's a perfectly valid question. I mean, we're, we're fully regulated by the FCA uh, and governed by HMRC. Uh, and when you send money to us, uh, it doesn't actually come into a smart currency account. So we bank with Barclays and the Bank of Ireland. Um, when you book a transfer of us, we'll instruct you to send the funds to us. But the funds would go into a client holding account. So they're completely safeguarded for you. So if anything was to happen to us as a business, um, the money would just be returned to the account that, it, that had come to uh, that, that, that had sent us the funds. Uh, so it's 100% protected and it just gets returned to you. Uh, and like I said, it, it doesn't go against our accounts until we've completed the transaction. Um, so yeah, it, the money's completely secure. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Paul. We will no doubt come back to you uh, a bit later. Um, but sitting very, very patiently is Anthony. Uh, so, Anthony, um, Anthony, tell us a little about a little bit about Beauvillage and and how, how you can help our customers. Hi. Thank you, um, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, dependent on where you might be. Uh, my name is Anthony Bryan. I have um, been living in France for 23 years now in the southwest. Currently reside just close to Bergerac in a delightful little town. Um, I've been in a state agency for 20 years in the area. Having run my own business, um, we merged uh, just over four years ago with Beauvillage. Uh, when I joined Beauvillage, we had about 10 uh, regional offices or high street shops, um, and we're now getting up to about 20. 
Um, so you can see sort of the, the progression of the company since I joined, it's grown phenomenally. Um, we were primarily focused on the international market, um, but since Brexit, we took a, a, a slightly different tack to try and uh, gather as much as we could of the domestic market because we saw perhaps that there might be a dip off in trade with the international market, in particularly the Brits. Um, hasn't necessarily been the case, but what it has given us is another string to our bow in that we do work very well in the local domestic market now. Um, we are about a 200 to, to 220 strong sales force on the ground here in the southwest. Um, again, it's a growing team, growing daily as people join training and become uh, compliant to be estate agents here. Um, and they work and they're based uh, linked to one of the regional offices. Um, I run three particular teams in the area. Um, as a regional sales manager, and there are others like me within the company who run other teams. Um, yeah, what, what, what else would you like to know about the business? Well, I suppose, I suppose one question is, uh, is in the UK, uh, we've seen property prices rising, shooting up by uh, extraordinary uh, level. What's happening in the French market? Um, we've seen property prices rising as well, not shooting up extraordinarily like you get we don't get peaks and troughs like you do in the uk it's more of steady rises and steady falls so that the, the wave is a lot less um it's a lot less risky let's say but then um you don't have the ability to make huge amounts of profit on on flipping properties like you would in the uk um it's we've seen a general increase let's say for the last three years uh, the number and volume of transactions has risen enormously in france Whereas before we were trading in the whole country around 800,000 transactions per year on average, um, we're now well over a million transactions. So you can see that the number of prop, um, property sales has gone up enormously, which has had a knock on effect in a reduction in the, in the stock on market. Um, and hence, likewise, following suit, uh, you're going to have an increase in value. Um, locally, we're probably looking at a 10% per annum increase over the last two to three years, something like that. <clears throat> okay, so that, that seems a bit more um, sustainable so, uh, than, than these big peaks and troughs that we've been seeing in the UK. Yeah, we don't like to see big peaks and troughs because I don't think for the longevity of the market it does any good because you'll, you'll yeah. inevitably have, have, a, have a downturn. Okay, um, so in terms of someone going out on a viewing trip say um well now um should one be offering a little bit below the asking price or are they just uh, turning over so quickly that that opportunity is gone the the properties are turning over quickly i won't i won't hide that fact we're we've i've been negotiating on a couple of sales today where we have three buyers wanting to buy um already with cash funds ready to go <coughs> excuse me and um, it, it, it's a question of you'll see it online one week before you come. And then when you come out the next week, uh, it probably won't be there or it's likely not to be there. And that will pro that's probably happening with around 40 to 50 percent of our stock at the moment. OK, um, just to just to bring back Paul for a second, then should one be coming out on a viewing trip with uh, your deposit ready? Uh, is does one have to have to, have to put money down on a viewing trip or does that come later but um, uh, sorry, i'll ask i'll ask anthony first and then and then paul can tell us how he can help it, 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 it's certainly a good idea to know exactly how much money you're going to have to spend in euros for sure which is why it's important to to have that discussion with the uh, the currency broker before you come um, and fix a rate if you can so, so you know what you're going to be able to afford while you're viewing property um, in, in terms of having the deposits in your bank or in the currency account um, so it's ready to go absolutely a good idea but you need to know the, that it's an amount that you'll be sending and it's 10 percent of your purchase price and you might not know the exact figure so have it ready in your account to transfer straight away um, but um, it doesn't get transferred into the notary's account until a bit further down the line when you've signed the first contracts. 
Okay, um, uh, shortly I'll bring uh, Lee in to tell us about those uh, that first viewing trip um, thing you have to sign that, that it's when it all feels terribly real. So Paul, you can you can help with those uh, with, with those deposits, I, uh, I assume. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, there's if you've got the money, as Anthony said, if you've got the money available in your your account ready to go, it can happen very quickly. Um, you can give us a quick call, we can book a spot contract, send the money straight to us, and we can have it into France. The same or next day so it's very quick um alternatively we have got a mobile app um if it's a smaller amount you can you can quickly you can quickly do it online yourself um if you if you prefer to do it that way but yeah we can get money into france for the deposit in the same or next day so it's, it's really quick great okay so uh, anthony what um what kind of you said that there's, uh, there's lots of buyers what are people buying at the moment is there a is there a kind of uh, a typical house or typical budget that people are no it's it's everything um it's it's all across the board really and it depends on the needs of, of the pe person who's buying or the people who are buying so typically for for first time um second sorry second home buyers uh it's still the the, the place in the countryside um with views bit of tranquility um but within striking distance of of amenities um if 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 they're more going to be dotting in and dotting back and forth which is a lot of what's happening with people since brexit now then they're tending to buy things that are more lock up and leave so that they haven't got huge maintenance bills while they're not using the property um we've seen activity from the lower end of the market with the small village houses um people looking to buy permanent residences wanting to live in communities um they don't want to be isolated uh, because they're living here year round and they want to have that um, ability to to be in constant contact with people on the doorstep uh, and we've seen a lot of activity at the higher end as well in the the luxury market luxury country properties chateau um and, and manoir and the like okay great um <clears throat> now you tell us you 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 offer a, a very comprehensive service for uh for buyers i believe it's a bit you know it's a bit more than just the salesy thing that we tend to get with British estate agents. Um, so uh, our fees, uh, which I imagine is reflected in the fees, are the fees paid by the buyers or is it paid by the vendor? Uh, generally, the way we work is paid by the vendor. That's not to say we're not working for the buyer. Uh, we're working for both parties. We're, we're, we're the third party involved trying to, to transact the deal on your behalf. So we'll 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 get the best deal for you that we possibly can, um, because it's in our interest to to do so. But generally, the way we work it, it's we're working with a vendor paying our fee. Okay, thank you. Um, now, moving on to uh, when you um, actually make make an offer. What's the, what's the process of making an offer? So I found the house I, I like. What happens next? Okay, so you can do it verbally, um, which is generally how it plays out, and you'll speak to your agent. Um, he or she will put the offer forward to the vendor, um, and it will generally be done verbally to start with. Um, once we have an agreement on, on the sale price um, or the purchase price, we will set up um, a, it's not a, a legally binding contract, but it's a small contract which shows um, positivity, positivity and goodwill on both sides and it's called the letter of intention and that sets out the sort of parameters for, for what you're buying um, and the price obviously um, will go in that that will run as a as a, as a sort of pre-contract for about a month which will give us the time to get all the documentation in place for a notaire to carry out his side of the work which is to get the compromis de vente ready, which is the first contract, which obviously Leia will talk about in a, in a minute or two. Um, sorry. No, okay, fantastic. Um, well, yes, uh, let's let's move on to. Um, well, actually, just before just just before we move on to uh, Leah, um, we uh, we've had a question from Paul asking about visas. Now I'm sure that that, that Leah will, uh, Leah will, will talk about those, but. Are you seeing more people retiring to France? Are they getting through the, the legal processes or are, is it mainly holiday homes? 
Um, it's become more difficult to get um, a permanent residence here and you have to be financially secure to be able to do so. Um, we are still seeing quite large numbers of people looking to to retire to the countryside here in France, yes. I wouldn't say they were at the volumes they were pre-Brexit date, but um, they, they, they are still relatively high. Uh, there are probably percentage-wise an increased number looking at second homes, probably in the ratio of 60 to 40. Yeah, that's what we found We uh, we found as well, that it used to be uh, roughly two thirds were, were, uh, were retiring and, and now it's a, it's it's balance has, has has changed but but clearly plenty of people are find, finding ways um and we'll come back to that subject in a minute so um uh, let's now introduce uh leah maynard from uh, buckles law if, if you could tell us a little bit about you and what and how buckles can help that would be great Yes, of course. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, so my name is Lea. I'm one of the lawyers with the uh, French team at Buckle Solicitors. We specialised in French property and inheritance law. What we do for our clients who are buying in France is that we offer uh, four uh, package services in that we will be there to hold your hand from the moment you are ready to make an offer on the property until the moment your purchase actually completes. And we advise not only on the purchase process, but also on estate planning, so making wills, etc., inheritance tax, ownership structure as well. And now we've got a colleague who um, has uh, the availability to offer immigration services, so she can also advise on everything visa related, which is becoming a, a very important uh, topic. Okay, um, now uh, the big question we're always asked is how long does the process take uh, between uh, choosing the property and actually getting the keys? I would say from start to finish, usually um, from the moment you make your offer and your offer is accepted, um, depending on how ready the file is, you would usually count two to three weeks to get your contract ready for signature. Once you've signed your contract, usually in France, there is a minimum of two months periods that has to be waited uh, because the law call authority will have a right of first refusal. So they need to be notified to make sure that they're not interested in purchasing the properties that you also want. And once this has run out, then uh, the sale can complete. So usually the deadline would be from signature of your preliminary contract three months, but you have to also add a couple of weeks on top of that before so that the contract is actually uh, prepared, prepared by the notaire. Right. And so um, while the exchange rate can move quite a long way in, in in uh, three months, I would, uh, I would imagine. Okay, um, do I need to be in France for for all the all the processes? Not that I wouldn't want to to pop over uh, uh, all the time, but do would I have to? Obviously, we would uh, never advise you to make an offer on the properties that you have not seen in person. That's because under French law, you are providing the property as is. And while you will be given some guarantees, there is nothing that can uh, compete against actually seeing a property in person. Otherwise, afterwards, uh, you do not need to be in France to sign your preliminary contract. Most estate agencies now uh, offer remote signature processes. And uh, if you are signing with a notaire, then you can do what is called the French power of attorney, which you can sign in the UK to give them authority to uh, sign the preliminary contract on your behalf. Completion, you do not have to attend. It is not mandatory. However, it is uh, also strongly advised because you need to check the property before completion to raise any issues. Some things we've seen is, for example, the sellers leaving a lot of junk in, in the barn or you know in the garage, which should have been cleared. And then if, of course, you discover that, two weeks after completion, when you can actually travel to France for your holiday, that is going to be a huge problem to solve after the fact. Okay. Uh, now, what what paperwork do I need to, to start the process of, of buying? Um, it's, it's not too complicated, thankfully, in France. Uh, you would need your ID, of course. Uh, we would always recommend that you have also uh, proof of the source of funds to make sure that not only for the legal side of things, but also if you are making a, a cash offer, uh, very often your estate agent is going to want to check that, you know, indeed your funds are 
ready to go. Um, otherwise, uh, very often the notary is going to want at some point to see your birth certificate and marriage certificates, but uh, this is fine to be provided only at the time of completion. So you do get a couple of months to get everything ready. Okay, who who, who organizes the uh, the notary? Is that something that you is someone that you find, or does the estate agent do that, or how does that work? Um, it it depends a lot. Um, we for a purchase, we would always recommend to work with a, a lotter who is local uh, to the property because they, while they don't you know go out and see the property themselves, they will have some knowledge of uh, how things work locally, the position of the local authority, especially if you're having some tricky things like a right of access or you want your purchase to be subject to planning permission, a local notaire is going to have more knowledge of the area than any notaire in France. Um, very often, the estate agent will be very knowledgeable on which notaires are responsive, which notaires are happy to deal with British clients because some of them do not like people who don't speak French. And uh, so notaires are um, state regulated officials and they will always take a neutral role. So buyers should never be worried about using a notaire that has been recommended to them or using the same notaire as a seller. That's never going to be a problem. Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting, yes. so. Um... So then, then uh, they're not going to be um, a replacement for the lawyer. Um, you still, you still need your legal advice as well. Yeah, it's not mandatory. That's some things we always make very clear uh, to our clients. You do not need a UK solicitor to advise you. However, the role of the notaire is really a neutral role, and the main goal is to defend the interest of the state and make sure that the property transaction is ironclad, which means that they ensure that all of the mandatory documents are prepared and provided to the buyers, but very often they won't actually flag up anything that you should be concerned about or that you should be looking into. And they will also make sure that, um, you know, the service are provided to you, etc. And then they make sure that the relevant stamp duty and property taxes, capital gains, etc. are paid. But a lot of notaires do not want to take on the role of advisors because it are acting for both buyer and seller. It would put them in a, in a difficult position, which is why you would want to have your solicitor not only to review everything, but to be always a person in your corner and also somebody who is, you know, based in England and is used to dealing with British people, because, of course, sometimes, you know, you will be told, oh, no, that's just the French way of doing things. Don't worry about it. And at that point, you will always have a little doubt. Are they just saying that to get rid of me or is it actually true? Which is why we, we think, of course, that it's always better to have somebody who can tell you, yes, it's absolutely normal. Don't be concerned about it. Or actually, I think we should, you know, dig a little bit further into why you're getting that answer and, and try and see what, what is at the bottom of things. Okay, now we've had a question from Tony. Uh, Costs of new pairs appears to be particularly expensive. Are they, or what, how much are they, and are they negotiable on that? So, notaire's fees are not negotiable. Notaire's fees are regulated by the French state, and it's actually really unfair to call them notaire's fees because um, they total around 8% of the sale price, but out of that, the notaire actually only gets paid around 1 or 2% everything else will be going to the French state. Most of the sum is going to be your stamp duty and there will be also various registration costs, land registry fees, etc. So they're not negotiable because most of them are taxes and set out by the state. And because the notaire actually doesn't get that much money from the overall amount, they are also not negotiating on this part that is going to them. Okay, and, and is that different for, for overseas buyers? No, not at all. It's the stamp duty in France is the same everywhere, except in a couple of regions such as uh, Brittany, um, Morbihan, I believe, where the uh, stamp duty is a little bit lower than uh, anywhere else in France. Okay, so if I'm setting a bike, if I'm going out to look at properties in, in France, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to um, Paul about the, uh, the the kind of exchange rate I'm, I'm going to get. <laughs> and I've got to speak to Anthony about what kind of property I'm going to get for my, uh, you know, and whether whether there's going to be wiggle room. How much have I got to add on the top for all the other fees? L lawyers' fees, notaries' fees, all that. Notaries' fees will always be around 8%. 
um, of the purchase price. So that's quite uh, easy um, to, to budget. Lawyers' costs, our fees do depend on the type of property you're purchasing. Uh, we don't base our fees on the value of the property itself. We feel it's not uh, the correct way of doing things because sometimes buying a, a small apartment, for example, can be legally more complicated than uh, buying a, a larger standalone property. But we do always uh, give quotes, of course, and we can also work on a fixed fee basis just to give our clients you know, a certainty and the ability to really budget um, what they are able to. OK, so if we added all, all that up, what, what, what did we come to? I'm, I'm not sure I was keeping track. Of that. No, that's fine. About so you, maybe twelve. Yes, I, I I think ten percent is a is a good ballpark figure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um. So I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to some of the questions we've been having asked in the chat box. Uh, do ask questions, people. Um, is it uh, from Helen? Is it worth taking up residency in France to get around the ninety days in hundred and eighty rule? Um. While I can't advise from a, a pure immigration perspective, one thing that you need to be aware of is that if you take up residency in France, you will be considered to be tax domiciled in France. And this is going to have a, an amount of ramifications that you must absolutely look into before you make decision. It means your worldwide income will be taxed under French income tax. Um, anything you sell anywhere in the world would be subject to French capital gains tax. And also, when you know, pass away, uh, French inheritance tax will be levied against your worldwide estate. So when you decide what type of visa to go for, you can't only think about, uh, it's, it's just going to allow me to stay longer in France. You have to really take a, a very global view of it and not only straight away how long I can live in France, but in, in the grand scheme of things, in the long run, how is it actually going to impact uh, your life overall? Okay, great. Um, now, let me uh, just go back to um, sort of uh, ask a few more general questions. Um, uh, when we're talking about tax, Elliot, when we buy a property uh, in France, what what are the initial costs that we're going to have to ha have to start paying? For example, is there equivalent of council tax? That might be a question for Anthony, maybe, maybe or, or perhaps uh, Leo as well. No, happy for Anthony to take it <laughs> if he wants to, of course. Yeah, one point <laughs> um, okay, so the 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 one ongoing charge that you will have apart from your utilities um is your your low tax or tax foncier um and that is the equivalent of the council tax it's based on your property so it's your property tax here in france and it varies uh, greatly from from one village to another and it's largely dependent on what services that village offers that you're buying in so if you've got a school you've got a supermarket you've got a cinema, you've got um, main drainage, you've got um, a college, you've got leases, your costs, you've got public transport, your costs are gonna be greater than if you're buying in a small village in the countryside um, that, um, that doesn't offer these services. Um, typically, you're looking at around 2,000 euros for a, for a reasonable sized country home. Um, 1,800, 2,000 euros for a large country home. If you have a swimming pool, it's another 200 euros on top, on average. Um, if you're looking at sort of town properties for a large townhouse in one of the bigger towns, for instance, Bergerac, you're looking at around four, three and a half to 4,000 euros. So it can be, can be double um, if you're in a big town with lots of services. There was a property, a tax called tax d'habitation, um, and I received a letter from the government this morning saying that um, from next year I won't be paying any, although this year I paid a small amount. And uh, in, in, as a gesture of solidarity with us poor people in France, they've now waived our um, TV licence this year. So um, that, we've got that to be grateful for. So the one main tax you will have is the tax funds here. Just okay, to, to add on that, if I may, um, the French government is rolling out, uh, is removing tax d'habitation, but only for people who actually are resident in France. If you have a second home, you are going to still be liable 
for the tax d'habitation. And this is usually calculated based on what the property would make if it was on the rental market. Okay, so um, uh, just looking back at um, Helen's question about the 90 days rule, could you just give us, a, uh, I appreciate that it's, um, it's not your, your precise uh, area of expertise, but perhaps you can, you can give us some idea of what the 90 days rule means, uh, uh, either, either one of you. Uh, yeah, so it, it's going to be very vague, I'm sorry, because I, I'm not an, an immigration lawyer. Uh, basically, the, the 90 days rule um, says that um, without applying for any kind of visa, you are allowed to spend 90 days out of any 100 and 180, no, any 180 days um, in a country of the European Union. So that's something to keep in mind is that if you uh, you know, you've got your house in France, you go for holidays, but you also like to go two weeks in Spain, etc. This is going to be counting towards you, your total amount of days. Uh, it's also not um, a very strict rule in that the 180 days don't uh, restart every 180 days. So that's something that has to be calculated quite carefully. And uh, I've known one client who got caught at the border because he didn't calculate his days properly and he was over his 90 days and then he was turned away. So it is something that you, you do have to be really careful about. I wonder what happens if you're in France and you've gone over your, your 90 days uh, and you start and you leave. I mean, if you bought the house and you suddenly start getting in trouble with the immigration authorities, presumably that could have serious ramifications. They might not let you let you back in again. Yes, that would be the consequence, is that at the time you leave France, uh, they will note that you did not comply uh, with, with your, uh, you know, legally uh, legal period of days. And they could make a note on your, your passport that if you do try and go in fr to France again, you will actually be barred from entering the country. Okay. Um, now, uh, Anthony, we've had a few questions on, uh, well, it's been all in, in the news about mortgages. What's the current situation on getting mortgages in France? Have 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 your mortgage rates gone up uh, like ours have, and uh, how easy is it to get a mortgage? Um, mortgage rates have increased here in France, yes, but we're linked to the ECB, the European Central Bank, and uh, not governed by the Bank of England here. So our rates haven't increased uh, to the extent that they have in um, in the UK. Um, it, it's become increasingly difficult to obtain a mortgage here um, in France. And it, it can often lead to a lot of disappointment, to be honest. Um, you can go down the route of, of securing a property and signing the first contracts with the mortgage clause in, having been told by your bank that you are um, liable to get a mortgage, and then that mortgage refused two months down the line, costing a lot of your time and, and heartache as well. Um, so we, we, we recommend where possible to make sure that you have a mortgage in place um, agreement before you offer on a property. Um, not always easy to get from your bank, I know, because they work on a, on a week by week basis. Um, UK banks are generally not lending to people buying property abroad um, now. Um, and we see more and more people are taking out an equity release on their UK properties to purchase abroad or to assist in a purchase abroad. Um, again, that's something I can't advise on, but it, that we see we see it quite quite often. If you are not working in, let's say, the, the French banks have, have tightened up enormously on lending to um, non-French or British residents, let's say, non-European residents. There are one or two still doing it, but getting a mortgage through them is very, very difficult, very complicated. Okay, yeah. and it, does it also complicate uh, the legal process? Uh, yes, uh, I, I want to really uh, support what Anthony is saying in that at, at the moment we are saying seeing a number of uh, purchases fall down, fall, fall through because um, the banks are just not giving mortgages. And we've heard through the, the grapevine of our mortgage broker contacts that French banks will not even consider uh, a mortgage application for a, a non-EU person if they are borrowing less than 500,000 euros. They just will literally not look at your file at all. And um, it does mean that when 
you you should still try if if you feel that you have sufficient reassurance from your bank that was there they will you know seriously consider you but it means that when you do sign this preliminary contract as anthony was saying you have to be extremely careful as to how your mortgage condition precedent is worded and you really have to take it on board because if you do not comply with, uh, you know, everything that is set out in this provision, including deadlines to make your mortgage application, uh, you are uh, very much at risk of, of losing uh, your deposit. And potentially, um, if you did not do any research, you just signed the contract being like, oh, yes, I'm sure we'd be able to get this mortgage that we're putting in the contract, uh, you could potentially uh, also uh, or damages uh, for having acted in bad faith. So it is extremely, extremely important to be very careful at the moment uh, with mortgages. I've had a, a purchase fall through just last week for a couple of clients who are millionaires and only wanted the mortgage uh, to offset against their French wealth tax and they were actually declined uh, by the French bank. So it, it does really goes to show that at the moment the financial situation is quite difficult. Okay, uh, we've had a question from Wolf, uh, who is a <coughs> a dual British and German passport holder, um, uh, but, he, but he's living in the USA. Could he or she, I'm not sure, get a mortgage in France as a German uh, as a German passport holder? A bit easier, I, I would imagine. Uh, I can't say. I think they would need to speak to a specialised uh, mortgage okay. broker, especially with the US connection. I, I do know. Um, the US connection can also complicate uh, complicate things. It's I don't think it's only an issue of nationality. It's also an issue of residencies and, and for the banks, for example. Um, if there is a default on the mortgage, they will always consider how easy it will be to uh, recover and to start recovery proceedings. And the fact that somebody lives outside of the European Union does now complicate a lot of things, especially for the UK after Brexit, where you can't automatically enforce any court order in a country. So for banks, that also becomes uh, a concern and a risk that they take into account. Okay, um, change of um, change of subjects entirely. I know a lot of people uh, come to France wanting to do a bit of re uh, renovation on a, on, a, on a property. They get somewhere a little bit too, think they can do it up. Uh, are those, I mean, in the UK, a lot of those, those properties have, have gone. Everyone's watched Homes Under the Hammer and they've done them all up themselves, mm -hmm. it, it, builders all come in. But in France, you still got a chance of doing that. I, uh, I would hope. Uh, are we talking about escape to the chateau DIY and, and the yes, like? that kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a few around. The, 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 a lot of it has has, has um, been taken up and snapped up. Um, we do come across still some uh, nice renovation projects um, and, and nice properties. Something that will, will turn into a lovely home for someone. Yes. But again, not as many as you might think. And I've just had a quote for some building work in the in the UK, and I did not know whether to laugh or cry. What's the situation in in France with 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 getting a builder? Um, getting builders uh, okay. Getting sensible prices out of builders not okay. Um, okay. The, the cost of new build in France has increased enormously. Um, so if you're if you're in, for instance, investing in a new build, um, tie your builder down and batten those prices down. Um, if you're investing in a property that needs renovation, get your quotes in, get your builder tied down um, and make sure that he sticks to the quotes and get him to quote exactly what you want doing. Um, the cost of cost of renovations is enormous. It's gone up. I can't give a figure exactly, but you're looking at over 2,000 euros per square meter on renovation in our area. New build, you're looking at over 3,000 in certain parts, dependent on foundation. So it, it's it's something that a, a year a year a few years ago was probably 30 or 40 percent cheaper, possibly even more than it is now, and that's to do with the cost of raw materials and shipments and things like that, largely. Okay. Um, now, if one is doing a doing a renovation project over a period, uh, Paul, just to just to just just to bring you back in, uh, if I'm making a payment sort of ten thousand this month and ten thousand next month, uh, are you able to help with that kind of a process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, we could if you know if it, if it's just two payments, we can 
we can book that as one contract and set it up as a forward contract for you. So again, it's the, the price is fixed. If it's a longer term, we have uh, what's called a regular payment plan. So if it's over, a, let's say maybe 12 month payments. You can do that as a, we, again, we can book it as one contract and you do a book, send the money on a standing order to us and we just chip away at the contracts. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We, we can, we can work um, to whatever the, the needs are. I, I suppose with, uh, okay, building, building costs might've gone up, but if you're selling in the in the UK and um, and sending your money over to over to France, <coughs> uh, prices property prices have gone up by sort of twenty five percent over the last couple of years. So uh, in effect, uh, you're still kind of quids in in, uh, in a way. It's, it's certainly not a reason not to fulfil your uh, uh, your plans. There's you know, there's there's savings elsewhere. Um, Thinking about planning permission, uh, uh, I know that it, it's bad enough here, and we all are slightly terrified of applying for for, for French planning permission. Um, uh, do you find it's a big problem with property buyers, or or can they usually get uh, get through their plans for for whatever they want to do with their property, Anthony? Well, are you there? Do you want me to go first, Leah? Uh, yes, happy to. Um... I find that France in general is more regulated than the UK in terms of what you, you can and can't do. Um, it, it's not to say that it's a bad thing. It's, it makes uh, France look uh, as lovely as it currently does. And it does protect, you know, the look and feel of villages. And it ensures that if you've got, you know, a beautiful view, you somehow have some guarantees that a nasty apartment building is not going to be uh, build next door but uh if you do have some you know really serious plan about what you plan on doing with your properties the main one is i think uh, a swimming pool you can uh, make your your purchase subject to obtaining planning permission which is something that we would recommend doing even though it does uh you know push the overall time scale quite a fair amount because the process is involved and you will have very often beautiful places like Bergerac. Uh, I've dealt with a, a couple of ones where um, because you are near a protected building or a historic area, you're going to have not only your local authorities, the mairie, dealing with this, but then the planning application has to be outsourced to the architect de bâtiment France, who is basically like a supervisory body of all architectural projects, which could affect uh, historic protected monuments. So it can take uh, quite a while. But um, usually, if, if you take proper advice and you do really engage in the dialogue with your Mary, uh, I, I have not seen anybody get their permission turned down as, as long as it was, you know, something reasonable and not build a, a massive uh, tower on a, a very uh, low property where there is a beautiful view and, and things like that. What's your experience been, uh, Anthony, with those? Yeah, I mean, I've I've had very few turned down. Most most are accepted. Um, one thing I would say is, um, you know, your agent is going to be able to put you in contact with local uh, architects or planners, um, who who having a meeting with them while you're viewing, uh, can give you advice on what will and won't be accepted um, in a particular area or village or town, um, and and that sort of that local knowledge of that you'll get through your agent means that you're going to you're working with him and he's working with you and helping you. Um, and I, I've just done one whereby we had a, a, a property purchase that's going through and a wall fell down. Um, <laughs> and, and it's still going through. He had the right to withdraw, but he still wants to go ahead because it's this is a, a wreck, one of the rare finds. Um, and, and it's in a beautiful position. And he's still enthusiastic about going through. And I put him in touch with a local planner. He's got an architect in the UK doing the drawings because he's a developer. And the drawings are being sent and modified here in France to, to, to cater it and tailor it for the local area and what will and won't be accepted. Um, we, we are in kind of viewing trip season. Uh, this is... Um, if someone is planning to come out to to France and see see properties, uh, can you go? Can you offer any tips on on what they should be doing? How long they should, they should be planning a trip that trip for? How many properties they should they should plan to see on each day, uh, and and anything else um, sort of uh, viewing trip tip wise, Anthony? Okay, if 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 you if you securing the knowledge of you know where to buy, 
and I, I cannot just say a, a location like the southwest um, but but hone it down to to a tighter area for instance around one or two particular towns or villages that you like that you know um, and that might fit the bill for you in terms of living or for your holiday home purposes um, focus in and around those areas so you're not traveling large distances it's a massive country and the southwest is bigger than wales um, so travel times can be can be quite quite sort of draining let's say um, if you're focusing in a tight area you can quite easily view five properties in a day unless they're uh, you know 20 bedroom chateau um, if your agent plans it right um, and has the stock um, to show you then five per day over a three or four day period some people spend a week and do less um, but generally three or four days is enough to one, give you a feel for the area, whether you, that's right for you. Two, see the number of properties. And, and, and um, three, have a little bit of spare time so you can spend time in the area getting to know it. Um, and maybe a, a, a last morning before you leave so you can do any second viewings to make sure that, you know, if you've seen a property you like, that it's it's right for you. And um, is it best if, they, if, if people bring their own transport with them? I know that car hire uh, prices are, are prohibitive at the moment but is, is it traditional that you would drive them around or would they normally have to have their own transport traditionally we would have always driven people around we won't pick up from airports and things like that because an airport might be two hours drive away for some people um so it's a question of getting to the local town nearby where your agent is and then your agent can pick you up and drive you around now since covid it's become a little bit more of a a difficult situation some people don't want to be in close confines with others which you can understand um but again that's something you have that conversation with your agent before you come out are you all right driving us around so we can just get from the airport to the village or the town and you can drive us um and, and hence save you know probably a couple of hundred euros that way so yeah have that conversation with your agent and in terms of uh, viewing trips it's the kind of thing that you might think oh we'll go out for a weekend uh, look, look at properties i'm guessing you don't do sundays but what, how about saturdays um it's not that we don't do sundays but if we're viewing french owned houses they, they'll just say no um because it's a, it's a family day for them um yeah. saturdays generally most agents will do um unless of course they've got uh, other other events on um, but most will do Saturday viewing. Some will do Sundays where, for instance, the, they might be viewing houses that are empty and say, look, if you're only coming for the weekend, we can do those on the Saturday and then we can do those on the Sunday morning. But Sunday afternoon, I'm having lunch with friends or whatever, um, that yep. sort of thing. OK. And if you're coming out, uh, uh, also if you're coming out at the weekend, you, uh, you wouldn't uh, presumably have, have, have a lawyer ready to just sort of check over anything that you're asked to sign. Um, are you um, are you ever asked to sign something on a viewing trip it's not like in some countries where you have to sort of put down five thousand as soon as you say yes it's 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 more like the british system isn't it where you would um you'd say you want it and then and then a, a deposit will be paid later so do you have to have have a lawyer sort of on on standby just in case you you find the property that you that you like no to, to make if you see a property that you like and you want to fly away back home or drive away back home securing the knowledge that the property you like you've had uh, you've offered on and the offer's been verbally accept, accepted by the vendors we get the vendor to sign a letter of intention which isn't legally yeah. binding for the buyer but it's 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 kind of legally binding for the vendor or at least it's it's insistent on them not to sell the property to someone else because they've verbally agreed um, to sell it to these people. And we put a time frame on that letter, which allows you to go away, have your second thoughts and make sure that you're doing the right thing. But also within that time frame, which is usually four weeks, the vendor can't sell it to anyone else. In that time, those four weeks, you can have your chat to your lawyer and make sure you, you get everything sorted in the right format. Purchase structure, that sort of thing. Okay, um, we, we, we're starting to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to approach, uh, approach the end. So in, uh, in general terms, uh, Leah, what are the, um, 
what are the legal questions that that people should be aware of when they're coming to uh, to France? Presumably, it's quite safe safe to buy. Firstly, so that's 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 a worry off their minds. Yes, um, very often something important is to understand what kind of building work has been uh, carried out on the property by the by the sellers because something that your lawyer is going to want to know and, and look into is did it need planning permission was planning permission obtained was it signed off etc if it wasn't which is very often the case in france it's not a deal breaker but then you know you, you need to be aware of the potential uh, risks that come with with buying a property where building work was done which wasn't uh you know legally signed off etc um otherwise you will get um at, with the time uh, of your uh, preliminary contract you will get your your set of survey reports we should you should really look into and review very carefully um very often um we find that um well, as Anthony mentioned, you know, the, the purchase of a letter of intent is not actually binding. It does set the tone and the expectations um, of the entire transaction. So if you do have any specific conditions that you, you wish to mention for this specific property you want to purchase, do ask that they are put uh, to the seller in writing. Because if you start uh, springing new conditions at the time of signing the contract, it does tense up the uh, conversation quite a lot. So that, that's something important. And, and really, I can't highlight how much uh, making sure your finances are sorted before you you do start you know committing yourself because um a lot of things that we find at the moment because of the mortgage being so difficult to obtain is that um a lot of british people will travel to france and says that they will fund the purchase from the sale of the uk property i can tell you from experience that in 90 percent of the cases this is just simply not going to work it's going to cause a lot of stress for everybody so that's really something um to to keep in mind is that if that's what you're planning to do, it's going to be very difficult to make it happen. So do, you know, of course, us as lawyers, we really start, you know, getting working, getting on with the file once you have found a property. But if you have some questions about your finances and how you're going to be protected once you found this property, do engage with a lawyer quite early in the process as well to make sure that once you are in France and you have found this property, everything is going to go very smoothly because you have ironed out all of those questions before you actually leave for France. Um, and the advantage of using a company like Smart, who's a, who's a property specialist, is that you can, at uh, Smart, you have a personal trader, that's correct, isn't it, rather than just some sort of app, and and the personal trader can just make sure that all the, all the processes are working safely. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll match you with one one account manager uh, and make sure that uh, for all the for all the big transfers and, and major decisions that you'll just deal with that one person. We have a team of traders. So obviously, if one of them, if you're if you're on the phone, someone else can pick it up. But yeah, we'll try and always make sure you're, you're with your one person. OK, um, it's a vast, great area. We, we could talk all day. I, I would just. Uh, uh, which is fortunate because uh, we have an all day event coming up, but I'm, I'm just going to ask this uh, this question first from Tony. I think I know the answer anyway. I might be able to answer this one myself. As Irish, uh, as Irish passport holders, uh, as well as UK passport holders, what is the requirement for us to come and go between France and England? Leah? Um, if you've got Irish nationality and Irish passport, you are European, so you can come and go between France and the UK as much as you want. You don't have to, to worry yourself um, about uh, visas and residences, etc. You do, it, it does have some implication in terms of your estate planning and wills, etc., which is not something that we'll get into because we probably need another uh, five hours to speak about that. But uh, yeah, it, it does make your life a lot easier in terms of the, of the traveling and, uh, you know, holidaying in France side of things. Yes. Um, I mean, there was always a rule that if you, if you were, you know, pre-Brexit, for, for, if you're going to live there for more than 30 days, you were still supposed to register, weren't you? You still had to um, make your make your presence known. But um, certainly uh, having an Irish passport does get around all those other, uh, other problems. 
So um, just before we finish, I uh, I just want to, um, well, firstly, uh, a big thank you to uh, our panelists, Paul, Anthony and Leah, who have given such full answers. Uh, like I like I said, you can get in touch with them directly and, uh, and, and you'll be given all the contact details uh, at the end of the event or they'll be sent, uh, sent to you. Um, my advice would be to get in touch with them directly and discuss your uh, your requirements because they are the experts. Uh, on our website, your overseas home and also France property guides, we have tons of information all about um, where to buy and how to buy and um, all that. But but the big thing I I, I I do want to mention is our our show your overseas home virtual on Saturday the twelfth of, of November where you can meet all the experts and chat to them one to one. Uh, you can see you can see properties, so you, you can be chatting with with an estate agent, uh, looking at his property, and on another screen you can be looking at Google and you can be looking at looking at the area. So it's just like going on uh, on a viewing trip, but it is of course um, uh, free, and you can do it from the safety of your own and uh, comfort of your own home. Uh, so do register for your overseas home virtual on the twelfth of uh, November. Um, thank you uh, once again. Paul, Anthony, and Leah, and thank you for for tuning in. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Goodbye. everyone. Bye. Bye.